please be seated. For my sermon today, I'd like for us to give thought to the prayer of humble access. It's on page 12 in your worship bulletin. And if you'd like to follow instead in your prayer book, you can find it on page 135. This prayer of humble access is a beautiful, rich prayer. It is also a stark statement of what Holy Communion is about. When you say this prayer, when you hear the words of this prayer, especially the last paragraph, you cannot avoid being gripped by the powerful images of our union with Christ. Now this is an old prayer. It was composed by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer to be used in the first Anglican prayer book in 1548. It has incorporated within it phrases, concepts from the liturgy of St. Basil, who was born in what is today Northeast Turkey in the year 329, and he died in A.D. 379. As a Christian scholar and a bishop, Basel had a lot to do with the battles against the ancient heresy of Arianism and in the finalization of the writing of the Nicene Creed, or its composition, I mean its uh, revisions. So part of this prayer that we say every Sunday is from, uh, parts of it from his ancient liturgy. This prayer also includes ideas theology from Thomas Aquinas, who lived a little bit later in the 1200s, 1300s. It includes also thoughts from Gregorian collects, and it alludes to a biblical passage from the Gospel of Mark and a biblical passage from the Gospel of John. So all that's in this prayer that we pray. So let's look at it this morning. So say together with me, if you would, the first paragraph. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great grace. So let's talk just a minute then about the differences between the word presume and the word Assume. And I think we can do it using gestures and words. I presume that, that's one. I assume that, you see the differences? Presumption implies a certain level of confident reasoning based on at least some perceived evidence. I think this might be the case, therefore I presume, whereas assumption suggests there is little evidence leading to more of a guess. Not really sure, I assume. How does this prayer begin? This prayer begins by cautioning us against unfounded presumption. What is it that we are wont to presume? What is it that we as humans tend to presume about ourselves? We presume that I'm okay, you're okay. We presume that we're upstanding people, that we're all basically good at heart, and that if given the right set of circumstances, we could prove ourselves to God and he would be satisfied with us. This presumptive reasoning completely ignores the biblical doctrine of the fall, the biblical doctrine of original sin, 
the biblical doctrine that we're all falling short of the glory of God so that based upon our own merit, we cannot enjoy God's presence, his pleasure, his blessing. We are not allowed and in fact are unable. So we are cautioned at the beginning of this prayer, don't presume that in and of yourselves, you do have that right to come. We don't have the right to come because we don't have a righteousness of our own. In fact, in this life, even as a Christian, you don't have a righteousness of your own. Not one that qualifies you to enjoy God's blessing. The truth of the matter is we come to him, we come to his table only because of his abundant and great mercies. And as the rest of our Anglican liturgy makes quite clear, we enjoy his abundant and great mercies. How? By faith in Jesus Christ and in his imputed righteousness to us. At the beginning of our long communion prayer of consecration, we say, when we have sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only son Jesus Christ into the world for our salvation and after our confession we hear the assuring words of absolution almighty God our heavenly father have mercy on you pardon and deliver you from all your sin confirm strengthen you in goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, before we leave our Sunday worship, we are reminded, thank you for feeding us. You feed us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. You see, our entire liturgy teaches us that our acceptance with God and our enjoyment of God is based entirely upon His abundant and great mercies given to us through Jesus Christ. And the chasm of our separation from God apart from Jesus is much greater than we are often willing to admit. And we are reminded of this again in this prayer of humble access. The second paragraph says, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. There's a reference to that passage I mentioned in the book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 28. It's a story where Jesus gently upbraids a Gentile woman, a Gentile woman who wants to have her daughter healed from demons. And Jesus reminds her that the Jews come first, <laughs> then the Gentiles. And he says to her, should I feed the dogs? Before I feed the children at the table, implying that the children at the table are the Israelites, and she's the dog. And she says, okay, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. <coughs> even in that, she had faith because she believed that the mercy of Jesus was great enough to trickle down and fall off the table even to Gentiles. And that's all she wanted. And she was right about that. We are not worthy. We are in the same boat as dogs begging for scraps. That's the analogy. That doesn't sit well. 
And in fact, there are some elements within the Anglican tradition that would have us remove such language because it's demeaning, they contend. It kind of is. It's just miserable groveling. It reveals weakness. It is shameful. And maybe that's the problem. Maybe there are elements within our Anglican tradition where there is no longer shame for anything. Perhaps we all need an Isaiah moment who said, woe is me upon seeing the holiness of God. For, he says, I am undone. I am undone. And we are all undone. We are all unworthy if judged in our own righteousness. But, look at the but. Okay? We are not worthy, the, the paragraph of this prayer says, to gather up the crumbs. But, the prayer reminds us, your character, your character is always to have mercy. Praise God. In Jesus, God is always merciful. Always. And what happens then when we come? He feeds us. He nourishes us. He affirms in all of this that you're my children. You're welcome at my table. He affirms that we are worthy. Not in ourselves, but he washes us. He cleans us up. He promises that we will never, ever be lost again, but will dwell with him forever. And these assuring words in the final paragraph are quite intense, are they not? Say then with me the final paragraph of this prayer. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and that our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Why such stark words? Why such powerful, perhaps troubling, even disturbing images? Why talk about Holy Communion like this? To reveal to us the reality and the mystery of our union with Jesus Christ. Our spiritual union with Jesus is of such an intimate nature that we, as Paul records in 1 Corinthians 10, when we receive the cup of wine, he says, we enjoy a participation in the blood of Christ. And when we break the bread and eat it, he says, we enjoy a participation in the body of Christ. <clears throat> the Bible in our Christian tradition uses this kind of language because we are talking about a sacramental union. You remember the story of the Passover in the Old Testament? There's sacramental language there, as it were. Meaning, there was the use of signs. And the sign was as good as done, as the thing signified. You remember that they, they killed the lamb, and they took its blood, and they put it on the doorpost. This was a sign. To the angel of God to pass over that house and spare their lives as per the promise of God. 
the sign of blood was as good as life. You had the sign, you had the life. It is like this when we come to Holy Communion. It is a sacrament. When we talk about sacraments, we talk about a sign, and we talk about the thing signified by that sign. In Holy Communion, what is the sign? Bread and wine. That's the sign of Holy Communion. What is the thing signified by those signs? Christ and all his benefits. That's what's signified by those signs. In this sacramental union, when by faith we receive the bread and wine, then we know we too have Christ and all his benefits as per the promise of God. Now the context that we read about in the Bible in which Jesus gives this promise is that of a meal. We eat and are joined to what we place in our mouths, right? In a spiritual manner, in the supper that we receive, we are feeding upon Christ. God took on human flesh to redeem human flesh from sin. The price was death because we had broken God's holy law and Jesus came as our substitute in flesh and died in our place to redeem the flesh. That's why we, in this prayer, talk about his flesh, his body, like we do, because that is essential for our salvation. In the entire New Testament, all our liturgy, many of the songs we sing, and this prayer, all talk about the blood of Jesus. Like in the Passover, his blood is life. So, like in a supper, there is this union that occurs between us and the food we eat. Even so, in spiritual eating, we are united to Jesus and his benefits by eating bread and drinking wine. Because the promise is attached to those actions. Now, an important thing to remember in this act of eating is not that it's a pledge of our commitment to God. It is not that primarily. So much as it is God's pledge of faithfulness to his promise to us. That's what that signifies. This is a pledge of divine acceptance because it's the promise of his pledge. Take this and you have it. You have what it signifies. All our catechisms, all our articles of faith teach us that through the preached word of God, the Holy Spirit supernaturally works to create faith in our hearts. And by the faithful administration of the sacrament of Holy Communion, the Holy Spirit supernaturally persuades us in our hearts of the truth of this glorious gospel. The Holy Spirit affirms through tactile means what we have heard with our ears. This is why we hear the preached word and why we receive Holy Communion every single week. Because we never reach a point in our Christian life where the good news is no longer required. So, think. Think of this beautiful and mysterious union with Christ Every time you pray this stark, troubling, magnificent prayer, 
and know for sure that your sinful body is made clean by his body and your soul is washed through his most precious blood and that because of this union you will evermore dwell in him and he in you. 